Think like a raindrop. When teaching teenagers how to do home repairs in homes in rural Appalachia, our construction guides would start each day with this advice. Think like a raindrop. That means that when caulking a window or flashing a roof, there is a really big difference between sealed and unsealed. Imagine if you're teaching this to teenagers you want to, who may not be quite as aware of just how complete every job needs to be uh, unless it's going to go wrong in short time or down the road just a little bit. I think we all know uh, from our own homes and projects how real that is. Left to its own devices, a raindrop that falls on a roof or a house is going to find its way in and down and after that, anything that happens is, is not likely to be very good. In our own, and yet there is a deeper wisdom here. Because flowing outward and downward, think like a raindrop, are all, these things are also the trajectory. These are also parts of self-giving and self-sacrifice. It is the downward path. Jesus loves this world so much that he pours himself out for it, flowing out, flowing down. Though in the form of God, Jesus did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave humbling himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. This morning we hear, time and time again, acts of pouring something treasured and valuable out of a vessel that is sacred and irreplaceable. Valuable ointment. Expensive stuff poured out over Jesus. Tears of sadness and remorse as Peter realizes what he has done and who he has lost. Those tears dripping down his face and then falling down onto the soil beneath his feet. Jesus' very life force flowing from, the, from fresh piercings on his body poured out, empty, gone for good. Father, why have you forsaken me, Jesus asks in his darkest moment. And we ask it too. God, why have you forsaken me today? Why have you let this painful thing happen how can you take someone I love away from me? How can you let this epidemic of violence and hatred wash over our people? Why have we been forsaken, left to weakness and total vulnerability? I don't want to wave away those, those very real and painful questions, it, it, but I do want to hold them up to two things that we hear this morning that I think are important from Jesus' passion. One is that Jesus' offer of himself, of giving, of self-emptying, are, are not a reflection of weakness at all, but rather a demonstration of perfect strength and grace. And, and the other thing is that woman with the alabaster jar. Because I think that she shows us something valuable. And that pouring out this thing that is so precious is exactly what we are supposed to do with something that we treasure. To pour something that is treasured and sacred out into the world where it can do some good. Where it brings comfort and healing and creates fertile ground for new life. That is how grace flows in this world that God created. Think like a raindrop. 
Yes, raindrops can undo poorly sealed roof lines. And yes, raindrops can find their way even into beautiful cathedrals like this. If you've ever noticed yellow buckets as you walk in, it's, it's life. It happens. But they, raindrops also carve rivers and they craft mountains and they water the earth so that new things can grow. There is no strength like that of a raindrop that with gravity and time sculpts the earth and creates life. Think like a raindrop. Speaking from the Buddhist tradition, Pema Chodron writes that the path of wholeness goes down, not up. As if the mountain pointed towards the earth instead of the sky. Instead of transcending the suffering of all creatures, we move towards turbulence and doubt when, however we can. If it takes years, if it takes, a li- if it takes lifetimes, we let it be as it is at our own pace. Without speed or aggression, we move down and down and down. And with us move millions of others our companions in awakening from fear. At the bottom, we discover water, she writes, the healing water of an awakened heart. But that is not the way of the world, is it? That is not the life that so many of us know. And the chief priests, the crowds, Pontius Pilate, the, and, and so many characters in this drama play a much more familiar game. Where We are not out to save the oppressed, where we are not out to save the world. We are out to save our skins. We are out to look after, number one, to take care of ourselves. But you know, if you read a little, you don't have to read too deeply in this passage to realize that they may be trying to save themselves, but they're not actually doing a very good job of it. Nassim Nicholas Taleb would call them, I love this word, fragilistas, meaning folks who mask their fragility with visible shows of strength, and power and importance. This is not a biblical word, but I think it's a really good one. Fragilistas. Have you ever met anybody or seen anyone who, who does that? Without the true strength that comes from vulnerability and self-giving, fragilistas survive on cunning and manipulation, on, on violence or the threat of violence, on leverage, on security, on shame. And time and time again, in Scripture and in our world today, they and the systems that they empower are revealed as brittle and fragile and ready to crumble, but with such real consequences for the children of God. Take, for example, the chief priests. Oh, they were strong, but their strength was at keeping their religion untainted by the ways of the world. They they had plausible deniability down to a science. They held on to power because they had found their way to the top of a particular food chain, and that would be ritual leadership. And they stayed strong by keeping their hands clean. Just as people of faith do when we fail to raise our voices against militarism and nationalism and injustice. Thinking that we just need to stay in our lane and these other things are just a headache and not ours to deal with. But when we do, when we hide behind those temple walls, the walls themselves become more brittle, more fragile, ready to collapse at the slightest bit of pressure. Or or take Pilate, who, who had power. He had power to do the right thing. He had, ex- he had the levers, he had the buttons that only a Roman administrator would have had. And this is a reminder that we all have power. 
We all have power and we are supposed to use it. We are supposed to use it in the service of justice. We are supposed to use it to create a world in which the children of God can understand and know dignity. But that was a little more than I think Paul, Pilate uh, had signed on for. He couldn't, uh, it says that Pilate pondered this, but one writer said, you know, maybe he really didn't ponder quite enough. I mean, maybe he wanted to do the right thing, but I, I get the impression that his dinner was getting cold and he just wanted to get on with it. Or take the crowd who soothed their manic anxiety by calling for a scapegoat while letting a violent man go free. Now let's think about Barabbas. Barabbas was not your ordinary uh, bandit criminal. He, he, it says in Scripture he, uh, he was in the situation he was in because he had committed murder. He had murdered in service to an insurrection. He was a revolutionary. He was a nationalist. He was a Judean who wanted to kick the Romans out. And he clearly wasn't afraid of, uh, of getting his hands dirty. Can we see why the crowd maybe wanted this guy? Someone who wasn't afraid uh, to use the sword to get his way? I think Barabbas must have had some sex appeal. They looked at him and said, hey, this guy's strong. He can be our champion. But he too, we know, he too was a fragilista. Because relying on violence only makes us weaker. How many times in the, the 2,000 years since this, have we learned this over and over and over again? We think the way of the sword is the way to go just this time. And yet time and time again we realize that that only leads to more violence, that only leads to more bloodshed, more pain, and that only leads to us becoming weaker. Not growing, but only growing smaller. You see, the way of grace is not found in taking, it is not found in clutching, it's not found in, in keeping at all costs, but rather in giving, in sharing, and even in pouring out. Now, uh, while on the subject of pouring out, um, have you ever had a really good cry? Right? Where it's basically like everything inside of you suddenly liquefies and suddenly comes out. Well, I want you to see that that's what happened to Peter in this. There Peter was, and I, I would say all throughout the gospel, Peter is sort of uh, reckoning with his own fragilista uh, identity, uh, wanting to hold on to getting a little bit of status, a little bit of power, and then all of a sudden this seems to be the moment. This is one where it all comes crashing down, where he realized what he has done, who he has denied, who he, what he has lost, and suddenly he grieves and he just, he just cries. It all comes out of him. But you know what? This was the beginning of healing. This pouring out was a sign of, of, of beautiful and wonderful grace. And it was grace when the woman with the alabaster jar showed what really mattered when she poured that ointment over Jesus' head. Now, the details in that really matter because... She takes the ointment. She doesn't do just sort of like a little tasteful dab. What does she do? She takes the whole jar and of, of, they tell us, not costly, very costly ointment. And she smashes the whole jar, really, really expensive stuff, and then covers him abundantly with oil, more, far more than was necessary. But she did it, something precious and irreplaceable. She took it and she poured it out. Why did she do it? For the sake of love. For the sake of love alone. And the lesson here is that Jesus is the ointment. 
Now, not just Jesus is the balm, uh, the healing balm, yes, um, in the Sunday school mode where Jesus is always the answer, okay, Jesus is the ointment, but what I mean is this, Jesus, when we think about when Jesus asks, and when we ask it to, why, oh God, have you forsaken me? Why have you forsaken us? Why smash us and make us completely open and vulnerable so that everything we think we are leaks out? flows out, hemorrhages out, and leaves us broken and empty. But Jesus, Jesus, if Jesus is the sacred ointment that gets smashed, in the jar that gets smashed, maybe the balm that is poured out is emptied, poured out precisely because it is so valuable precisely because it is so irreplaceable, so precious. This is the way of grace and new life. That these vessels that hold our love, that these vessels that are the most precious, that hold Jesus, that hold each and every one of us, that it's in breaking those jars and pouring them out that we become a part of this flow of grace. God does not forsake us. God takes us, each and every one of us, the costliest and most valuable appointments, God's own beloved, every single one of us, and smashes the vessels that contain us so that we can flow towards newness and resurrection. Those jars, we put all of our hope in those jars. They're so beautiful, so finely made, we can never replace them. But no, the jar, it turns out, is more fragile and more breakable than we ever imagined. But the ointment within it, that precious treasure that is the heart for love that God gave us, pours out. And that which we, and we become even more beloved of God as we flow out into the world. Amen.